And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Rat Tower Software, and surrounding us with rats. So many rats. The, so, so many that you could do a rendition of Three Blind Mice. And creator of the, up, of the upcoming immersive RPG, Monomyth. The one, the one and only Michael Trolls. How are you doing today, man? Uh, I'm doing very nicely. <laughs> I'm doing good. Thanks you. Thank you. So, I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings. Now... Ooh. I, now, um, Wano Myth is an is an immersive sim RPG, and not not quite when when it came out. Uh, I was playing Ultima Online as one of my. F first real RPG ex uh, uh, experiences. This was back in, I think, in 2001, and I did not play it on the official servers, uh, but on, uh, on, a, on a German uh, role-playing shard, right? Schattenwelt was the uh, role-playing shard I played on. And um, the thing with that is... Uh, Role-playing shards are very different from, uh, well, not that different in the case of, uh, of Ultima Online, but normally very different from regular uh, MMORPG servers in so far that the game masters, the, you know, the staff that runs the server um, directly influences and controls uh, things that happen in the world. You know, they, I don't know, they spawn demons or dragons or monsters or they organize events, etc., etc. And uh, in the same sense, you could do a lot of things you could not do on a regular server. So you could like, um, let's say, organize a guild that essentially runs... Um, a town that is that is already in the game, not just like a player town, but actually a game, a, 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 a town that is included in the game. Um, so you you form your own little systems, your own little, let's say, even um, governments, uh, parties, factions, nations, etc. So all very, very, very highly interactive. Uh, highly immersive also uh, and uh, that was was basically my introduction to um, very interactive immersive world uh, and also in a sense to well, not to role-playing games I've been playing role-playing games before that but um, to role playing as like this highly interactive uh, genre, right? Uh, that you, I, 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 I heard a couple of other interviews from you. I think this this channel is more like focused on on pen and paper stuff, right? Um, it that was that pen and paper was my was my origin mm -hmm. story. Okay, but I'm no, but I'm no, but um, that's but it's mainly I mainly focused on that when it came to my reviews because that because mm -hmm. that was something that was. Um, untapped and e and easy for me to edit. Yeah. yeah. Um, since I don't I don't have to go around get I don't have to go around getting specific footage because my editing skills are not that great. But there's okay. also the fact that um, <clears throat> a big part of my philosophy is tr is intersecting, um, t intersecting and cross pollinating tabletop with other media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would, I would, I would even, I would say that um, you know the introduction that most people have or uh, to to role playing games uh, through you know pen and paper games through Dungeons and Dragons or in uh, in Germany and Austria it's um, Realms of Arcania, uh, the Dark Eye. It's I'm, the most popular system. I'm, um, I'm familiar I, with the mm -hmm. I'm familiar with the Dark Eye. In, mm -hmm. in fact, um, yeah. a few days ago, I had put I had put up a review of its um of its fifth edition. Um, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. I will I will I will admit that when I, quite <laughs> quite heavy on I, the rules. <laughs> um, not as not as much not as much as not as much as I would compared to other games that I've covered. Mm -hmm. Um. Dark Eye Fifth Edition isn't as isn't as cru isn't as crunchy as um as as um, as some would cl as some would claim um, attention. Whereas yeah. Um, the fifth edition translation was handled by um, Ulysses Spiel, who mm -hmm. have um, yeah. have an actual budget. <laughs> yeah, they are they are the the actual publisher, I think, in in Germany of of the um, of the books in general. Yeah, but if if it were if it was always this complex, even in the, even as early days, I cu I couldn't tell because I've never. I've never looked at those early editions. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was, it was quite, it was quite complex, and with all, all its rule systems, it's like uh, up to uh, more than I think uh, a thousand pages of. And uh, it's, it's interactive world, and it's uh, the, the role playing chart we played on. Uh, so, so that was like the, the the first step into that direction, and later on, of course, I also played uh, you know stuff like uh, Deus Ex. I I uh, played through that. Um, I played System Shock, uh, System Shock Two. I even replayed that recently. Uh, still pretty fun, uh, and also then. Uh, I played something that was not an immersive sim, but that got me into more immersive sims. Oh yeah, I also played Thief uh, back in the day. Uh, so one one game that got me into more immersive sims, despite not being an immersive sim itself, was actually Kingsfield, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, back in 2014, I think. I think it was 2014. I was waiting for for Dark Souls 2 to come out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I thought, well, uh, I mean, let's take a look at uh, you know uh, from software's older games because maybe they are similar, maybe they are fun. Uh, and so I took a look at Kingsfield, actually Kingsfield 2, but in the US it's Kingsfield 1. Uh, that's uh, that's because uh, the first Kingsfield um, was never released in the West. I don't think so, at least. Uh, but uh, the U.S. numbering basically uh, starts with the second game, and I played that, and I was um, very much into that. Uh, so I, I liked that that game a lot, and uh, so I thought. That is that is a that is a great game. Are there any other games like that? And the thing is, there aren't really, <laughs> there aren't, there are barely any games like uh, Kingsfield, um, except for Ultima Underworld, basically. Uh, and Ultima Underworld. So I played 
that then. Mm -hmm. And from there on, I basically played the whole um, the whole catalog of Looking Glass games. Um, and of course, also replayed a lot of those. I, I replayed Thief a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Thief is uh, probably one of my, my favorite games by Looking Glass. Thief 1, actually. So yeah, that's, that's how I, I got... Uh, into the immersive sim genre over a couple <laughs> across a couple corners mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah that that's also the, the inspiration for for you can you can only you can only pick one you can't pick both <laughs> thief, thief one, one thief, <laughs> thief one or thief two uh, thief one with the exception of Of Thief Skilled. Um, Thief Skilled <laughs> is <laughs> Thief Skilled is uh, Thief Skilled is a map from uh, Thief One uh, Gold. Mm -hmm. So there's Thief the Dark Project and yep. there's Thief Gold. And Gold has, I think, three additional um, levels and a couple changes. Yep. And those three are with the the the, the Mage Tower. A Caverns of Song, I think it was Caverns of Song. I'm not sure anymore. The, the one with the opera. Um, yeah, yeah, and the and the and, and, the, most, and, and, and the most annoying NPC, <laughs> the most annoying yeah. NPC with his singing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, also Thief Guild. So um, Thief Guild is a, a level where you know, okay, this is a cool idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is an interesting idea, but it's way too big and way too complex and uh, way sewers. <laughs> and way too many sewers. Yeah, uh, I have come to to realize uh, that uh, it's only a real it's a real problem on the first playthrough. On the second playthrough, actually, Thief's Guild is. Um, it's. I mean, if you if you just recently played it, it's probably even fun or could be fun. Uh, on the second playthrough, normally it's bearable. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but no, actually. So so I, <laughs> my my um, my favorite thief game is is Thief One, and particularly uh, Return to the Haunted Cathedral. Is my favorite mission probably a lot of people say the sword, but um, which is also a great, great mission. But but I I think my favorite one is Return to the Haunted Cathedral. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thief two Thief two had a bit of uh, my my or my 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 issue with Thief two. Actually, maybe let's let's uh, go at it from the other uh, other other way. Mm -hmm. uh, a people's problem with Thief One, I heard, is the adventure levels. You know, with a lot of undead and uh, the the caverns, uh, the 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 one with the the buricks, I think these these um, dinosaur-like creatures, mm -hmm. um, and they say, ah, well, this doesn't have much to do with thievery i want to you know hop into some windows and steal some gold and do that stuff and that's very well done in uh, in the second game that's true that's that's more of a focus in the second game especially life of a party i think is the mission um but my my main issue with the second game was some of the later missions felt uh, repetitive i think there is this museum level where you have to enter twice mm -hmm. which is was not uh, so interesting to me uh, the last mission while it was great in terms of narrative with um Karis speaking to you from the speakers very uh, nice uh, guy 
um, but also a very big level. But uh, overall, pretty pretty fun. So I, I like both games, obviously, very much. Um, but I, I personally prefer the first one because I, I don't mind the adventure levels, actually. I, I like them a lot. Yeah, I've, I remember I remember people com I remember people complaining about that kind of thing. Except, um, the I pref I prefer I prefer variety in my in my thievery. Mm -hmm. But for me, it, for me, the reason I end up leaning more to, leaning more towards the for, leaning more towards the first rather than the second um, has to has to do with the fact that not every not every mission in um, in the in the dark project is t is tied to the overall plot. You mm -hmm. you have you have you have a mix of plot episodes yep. and st and standalone episodes. Yep. Whereas um, with Thief Two, every single mission, um, with ex with the exception of the first one, ties it ties into the ties into the plot, and it's a it's a case where the Mm -hmm. The plot isn't ba the plot when it comes to the whole thing with Karis and and everything. It's not bad, but it is more invasive. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it's um, it's very much focused on around around the mechanists. And in in Thief One, Thief One also it takes a couple of missions to to really get going. I think the first mission that really, I mean, the first mission that really introduces you to the to the storyline essentially is the sword. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know which mission that is. Maybe uh, oh, four. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. The, um, the point is, the point is, you have you um. You have some time. You have some time to breathe before the shit hits the fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's the sixth mission, and actually the seventh mission in Thief Gold. Probably after a Thief's Guild. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's uh, but a bummer. Some, but some of the other some of the other games that you've mentioned that that you've taken that you've taken inspiration from. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Ultima Underworld is is one of the big ones. That's what that's the um, that's the granddaddy of the pro of the project and the thi the thing that got everybody's attention from Looking Glass. Mm -hmm. Um, or at, at least at least until at least until um at least until Carmack said that he could make a better re could could re could render that kind of three D in less time, which mm -hmm. would yeah. which sounds pretentious. Well, until he did it. He could do it, yeah. <laughs> though, though it is not quite exactly the same. It's um, it's like uh, it take one uh, cannot. I think at least uh, it take one in its original iteration cannot render. Um, it cannot render slopes on the one hand. No, I, I think, and I think it can also not render. Um, rooms that are above each other. No, uh, uh, that's there is a trick for that in in some some level. I think I don't remember it, but I think it can't can't do that. The engine can't do that, so it's always it, referred to as two point five D or something. Yeah, the um, you couldn't you couldn't really do even even um something more advanced like the build engine couldn't couldn't fully do um. Room okay. over room properly, and they, ch there, there, and um, because of that, because of that, a lot of those engines would. Okay, okay <laughs> let me let me get the out of, out of my system first. Can we assume <laughs> that you will not be using anything closely resembling Arx Vitalis's magic system? <laughs> well, I mean, um. Uh, not not uh, probably not the gesture system no 
Um, I thought about stuff like the like the Chester system, but more. Uh, I, I wouldn't say accessible, but uh, less prone to to error on different systems. This is actually something that I'm <laughs> that I'm always very very uh, cautious with. Uh, if if stuff can go wrong on you know different resolutions and uh, it, if you if you run the game on a different system. Uh, and and the gesture system in in uh, Ox Fatalis, it can be fun if it if it works. It can be very uh, it can be a very fun experience. But uh, on like the on newer systems that uh, in uh, the to making, um, um, speculating. But I think the gesture system was was added towards the end to add some marketability to the um, to the class. Uh, because it's like uh, I, I I I recently had the box in in my hand and, and I I looked at it uh, and. The the gesture system is of course you know big uh, a big screenshot on the back and it says yeah you can draw your own magic and whatnot so it's a it's a marketable feature but it is very um, it's very much its own thing uh, by which I I'm trying to say uh, the game would still work without it very well and even without the gesture system the magic system would be interesting on its own because it's just the the rune system from from ultima underworld <laughs> so uh you you're doing exactly the same stuff in in uh, ax fatalis like in ultima underworld you collect the runes uh and you combine the runes in a sense but uh instead of just clicking on them you draw them uh, you could leave from uh, a mechanical perspective, so that feature you uh, you could drop it completely, and Oxford Tell is be much different. And I I even believe, um, I'm not sure, but. but I mean, it makes sense. Uh, I think the Xbox version of Ax Fatalis. Ax Fatalis also came out on, I think, the first Xbox. Uh, the the gesture system was obviously not in that because the Xbox has no has no mouse control, obviously. There's uh, no way so you're doing that with sticks. Yeah, exactly. There's no way you can do that with with, with the analog sticks. Uh, but what they did was, I think, I think at least, I'm not entirely sure. I have not seen that version in like uh, a long long time but what they did i believe was you know doing like a, uh doing it like a, a combo system in in um fighting games basically you are uh, pushing the analog stick into different directions and that's basically forming the room that you're currently drawing in air quotes uh that is not such a I, I thought that was an, an interesting less prone to error approach uh than the drawing on the screen uh whether it's worth it and whether it works i don't <laughs> i don't know um but it was an interesting idea i think at least outright useless like Yeah. Who the hell's going to take swimming? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, yep. <laughs> was that something that you were conscious of to make sure that um, each skill was going to have some kind of use? Uh, yes, actually, uh, yes. Um, I mean, I'm that skill system. I, in the beginning, when I when I started. Um, uh, developing Monomyth, uh, that skill system was not in at all. Uh, so that was not planned in the original design document. Uh, but throughout the years, I realized, well, I mean, you know, we have attributes, we have attribute checks, we have all kinds of ways to make... It's it's basically, again, coming from a different... Uh, from, from The opposite direction at it i only put in the stuff that really was necessary and um and not like uh what can i think of what could i can i could i could i put in there uh what sounds cool and might end up useless basically so uh i already had in mind uh the things or oh, i already had things in the game to do that could be linked to um, the skill system, um, the of course it's still. I mean, it's still uh, an issue, or well, not an issue, but a challenge to properly distribute uh, challenges that can be solved with a certain skill. So, um, are there enough? Let's just say, are there enough uh, doors in the game that you can lockpick, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, are there enough uses for uh, the athletic, the athletic skills? So, can you actually, you know, uh, climb climb somewhere or jump over some some um, uh, some uh, chasm or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that is then. An important challenge and it's also important for level design of course because you want to do this this feature driven level design you're not just you don't just want to um, you know make some world and then drop some challenges in there and then call it a day no you actually want to think of the rooms that you're building think of the the landscape that you're building um in terms of the item and again in another way with a spell so you have like these um these activities the player can And, um, can engage in and uh, you build your world and your levels around that uh, so no skill is, so you have to try to, to balance that properly so no skill really is uh, useless or something right mm -hmm. and with given given that I'd, I'd like to I'd like to touch a bit of a bit about um what the what um what the attributes and how the attributes and skills are going to be in, are going to be intersecting now mm -hmm. some some of some of the some of the um attributes i can already, i can i can more or less figure i can more or less figure out just by um just by just by vir just by virtue of exper of experience um stuff like strength mm -hmm. dexterity i can, yeah. Yeah. um i can i can see how that's going going to work going to work out um mm -hmm. When it comes, um, what what sort of? Th I have I have my guesses, but what sort of things? What sort of checks would um st would stuff like intelligence, will wisdom, willpower, and um, actually, 
and focus be utilized for? Mm -hmm. uh, these are mostly related to the um, casting class. Well, not the casting class to the to the caster uh, character type. Mm -hmm. um, so intelligence is uh, more or less uh, linked to. There, there are three three schools of magic there's the cosmic school of magic there is the divine school of magic and there's the aura school of magic uh which you know you could say is like nature magic but it's not really but it doesn't matter um so these three schools of magic are basically linked to intelligence wisdom and willpower intelligence is for the cosmic school so um everything that has to do with uh, you know cosmic influence uh requires you to um, think in a very abstract way and grasp this cosmic horror or whatever you're coming up with in that spell wisdom is then um the classic cleric uh, attribute, uh, you know, for the divine school, for healing, buffs, uh, etc. Uh, and willpower, simply the willpower to uh, shape reality around you. So you're basically willing um, changes in the nature around you into reality. So that is what willpower is. So these three are basically linked to the um to the schools of magic pretty much pretty much there are some some um overlaps in uh a few spells that are not as clearly classified uh in 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 that in a in a in a in a school of magic and focus focus is basically your your potential your your arcane potential so it's on the one hand it's of course um uh mana right so uh mp uh and uh it, but it also at the moment in the current um build it also determines how many spell slots you actually have because in monomyth you go to a shrine and there you attune your magic uh, you you have you first of all uh, first you have to find a magic scroll right so you find let's see a healing a uh, healing spell and then you go to a shrine and then you attune that healing spell uh, and the more focus you have the more spells you can remember uh, and of course also cast because you have more MP. So that is that is the focus um, attribute and those three um, intelligence, wisdom and willpower. Mm -hmm. um, now when it comes when it comes to skills, once once again a lot of the a lot of the ones um, present I can I can can I can kind of get the general vibe for, but there's mm. there's a there's a couple that I'm uh, that I'm a bit curious about. Those mm. being anatomy and arcane connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe let's start with arcane connection because that's what uh, one thing I forgot actually. Arcane connection is uh, a general a general arcane skill that. Um, increases the uh, the efficiency of your spell doesn't matter which school of magic it's just uh, about you know the arcane connection to whatever mm, school of magic uh, you are you're currently performing uh, and at a certain point arcane connection also gives you you know a, a slight just a slight bit of um, MP regeneration uh, at some point, uh, and that is actually true for so so this 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 special effect is actually true for a couple other skills as well. So at a certain point, you get um, they get bloody, and uh, you can um, wash those bandages again. Mm 
and then use them again and the better you are at anatomy the better you heal yourself up uh, but anatomy actually gives you the ability to charge your enemy's health when you um, lock onto an enemy in monomyth it says um, you know like in like in Baldur's Gate, for example, very healthy, uh, wounded, healthy, badly wounded, near death, and so on and so on. Um, so, the more anatomy, or the more skilled you are at anatomy, um, the more accurate that representation is. Um, so, how how wounded your enemy is, uh, you will have a better idea of that, and. The, the, this goes as far as uh, having a, an actual an actual energy bar, right? Mm -hmm. Like an actual uh, an actual health bar. Um, so that is something that's down to the judgment of the player character, um, and you can only have this through that anatomy skill. Yeah. Now, when it comes since we since you've mentioned a bit on. Um... On the ma on the magic system, mm -hmm. um, as a, uh, and the and the whole thing and the whole thing with slots is is it a, is it a case where um, where you're o where you're only going to have a very you're only going to have a very limited amount of slots for when it comes to the spells that you f that you find and equip. Um, I mean, you will have a limited amount of slots. Yes. Um... I think it is enough to to really um, get a strategy a strategy going with your magic or with your spells. Uh, but yes, it's 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 uh, limited to a certain certain a certain amount of slots. Mm -hmm. Now, I er, before we went live, I had I had joked how how some how um some pe how some people. Have uh, some people made Dark Souls comparisons when that when <laughs> that's um when that's a when that's a bit tenuous, even though even though it fits in a round in a very roundabout um, str um <laughs> stretching stretching like you're having like you're having Mister Fantastic drawn and quartered kind of sense, but with but within within the but one thing that I will concede. When it comes to that comparison, is the um, shrine mechanic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where you, where you have the, you have places that you can you, know, you can recover that you can recover in that regard, and mm -hmm. um, that's the main place where you're going to be applying your um, benefits from leveling up. Um, now in the now within within that regard, there was mm -hmm. there was one that. There were there were um there were three there were three part there were three parts of that that um s that two two of which I can ki I can kind of make sense of but one one of them I'm a bit curious about since it didn't really play as much of a factor in the demo um, <coughs> now leveling up self-explanatory yeah. um, attuning ma attuning magic I <coughs> have an idea on, on that but I'd li I'd like to go into a bit more detail if possible. And atone mm. for sins is the is the um, mystery box. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. What can you tell me about the latter two? Um. Well, I, let's let's maybe uh, the, this whole this whole shrine mechanic. Mm -hmm. Um. It's true. This is actually um, inspired by by the um, the bonfire mechanic in. Um, in Dark Souls, and also uh, is very well. It was similar. It was similar to um, to the the checkpoint safe system in um, Kingsfield, essentially. Uh, but the thing is, with the years, um, Monomyth, from a design perspective slowly shifted more and more towards uh, Ultima Underworld, 
right? So in the beginning, I was like, yeah, okay, let, let's uh, let's make something like uh, like Kingsfield. Not only because Kingsfield is fun, but also because Kingsfield has a limited set of features that is easy or like that. But with the years, and I accredited a little bit to feature creep. That's why I'm always I'm always cautious about it. Uh, with the years, I implemented systems. I implemented uh, spell system, um, character systems, etc let the gameplay drift more into the direction of Ultima Underworld and uh, Ax Fitalis. But I still had had the shrine system in there and in an even earlier alpha version of uh, the game, I even had um, enemy respawn. Uh, but the thing is, these these features uh, only only work to a certain extent uh, in a game that is more and more like Ultima Underworld. Actually, actually, for the shrine, it's not entirely true because the shrine has similar f mechanics in Ultima Underworld. Um, but yeah, uh, so 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 just that about the history of this this shrine mechanic. Originally, it came from from Kingsfield, and uh, as the game developed more and more towards Ultima Underworld, uh, it it took more or less the backseat. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, now it's even taking it's again taking the backseat. Because um, I actually uh, the other week I I changed the safe system, uh, which was the correct design decision. I can go into that later, um, maybe. Uh, but but yeah, so that's that's like the the um, that's like the history of of that shrine uh, shrine mechanic. And um, now to your questions. <laughs> Sorry for sorry for going into that much detail with that, mm -hmm. but uh, about your questions, um, shrine is there as like the central, uh, or, or is there as a central point in the game, and so you can atone for your sins, and atoning for your sins means uh, when there is a neutral character in the game, mm -hmm. um, and you attack that character. Uh, you obviously have a problem or may have a problem. You go to a shrine and uh, you atone for your sins. You sacrifice a certain amount of gold. And then... And the uh, NPC, the neutral NPC you attacked will be friendly again, right? So that's more or less uh, um, a, a way to, well, uh, as it says, atone for your sins yeah. uh, to to get um, the possibility to get a second chance with an NPC. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, uh, atoning for sins, which is also similar in well. I mean, <laughs> you already you already said we always have these Dark Souls comparisons, but uh, which is also similar in, in in Dark Souls. Actually, in Dark Souls, there is an NPC for exactly that. Um, uh, there is, I mean, there's some 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 more intricate mechanic behind that, but nevertheless. Uh, so atoning for sins is um, getting friendly with an NPC again. Uh, and uh, the other thing, attuning magic, is uh, basically uh, selecting from a certain school of magic, a spell from a certain school of magic, and remembering it for later use. And all of those spells that you can select there, you have to find first in uh, the form of a scroll and you attune that uh, spell and then you can uh, cast away 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, um, with the, now one of the other things that I wa that I wanted to de that I wanted to delve into is inv is involving the key is involving the keyword based design with um with mm -hmm. di with dialogue with NPCs. Um, how ex what what was the What's the inspirations for that, and um, how and how is it implemented within the uh, game? Uh, I mean, there are, are two two inspirations there. Uh, one for one, the original inspiration, and then the game that actually improved on it. Uh, the original inspiration is Ultima Seven. Ultima 7 had uh, a similar keyword-based system um, and so so you so you, you talk to an NPC and you ask the NPC about you know their name their job uh, whatever they uh, do and say and then uh, during the conversation you get new keywords you can also ask them about right mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, you ask a fisherman about his job and he tells you, yeah, I'm out here fishing and then you ask him about the fish and so on and so on. Um, and the game that actually improved on that was uh, Morrowind, where you had a similar keyword system except more... Uh, you ask the guy about the fish and he asks you, do you like fish? Yes, no, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, um, uh, there, there, I mean, there were, there were, I, I believe there were dialogue trees, some dialogue trees in Ultima 7 as well. Well, but I'm not entirely sure anymore. Uh, and and when they existed, I think I think some existed, but they were not as detailed as, for example, a conversation in in Morrowind, where you actually ask a topic, and then you go through this whole dialogue tree. So th those are the the inspirations for that system. Uh, for that dialogue system and what monomer does a little bit different is um, it differentiates between topics that you just heard in the um, conversation and topics that are more general so stuff you could have for example read in uh, uh, in a, a certain document you read in a certain document about a certain artifact, and then that is a general talking point that you can ask any NPC about, uh, but not every NPC, of course, knows something about uh, every every uh, keyword that you can ask them about. Uh, so, yeah, that is the, the additional differentiation during the conversation. And... Uh, tell me about so and so and mm -hmm. those are the general keywords the global keywords so to say that you can ask everyone about yeah and obviously obviously when using when it comes to getting these kind of informations you can't rely on everything that that every npc is going to say because well some of them are pro some of them are probably going to spin you a yarn <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah there's this <laughs> There's this um, this theory mm -hmm. uh, going again, going again back to to Dark Souls. <laughs> I suppose we can't escape it. Uh, <laughs> so you can't really trust anyone. And of course, in in in, in, in Monomyth, um, I, I I'm not saying that everyone lies to you, but you should. You are in a in a in 
a different fortress. You know, every every um, na or not. People in, in Monomyth live in these fortresses and uh, you are visiting a different fortress. And of course, as an outsider, not everyone is that ready to tell you the truth or tell you what you want to know. Uh, so you have to watch out there as well. Yep. And when it, com when it comes to... Um... When, it com when it comes to the, se the, setup, that you ha the setup that you have... Um what are you shoot what are you shooting for as far as far as um well actually I had some I had some but I but I need to shift to a, to a different either avenue when it comes to equip when it comes to equipment use that is is some is something that can arguably add immersion but is a controversial topic at the best mm -hmm. of times, and that is item durability. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your What's your take on that? On On that is it going to be a case where we where we're going to be running the risk of have of having our weapons breaking, or is that not something that you're um, considering? Um, I have been thinking about item durability a lot, and um. I have been thinking about ways how to implement it. Uh, it is currently not in the game, but it would at a certain point or for a certain, if it's used in a certain way, it can add to the game. Uh, it can add to you know tension to um, item management. It's uh, essentially so you you take for example a look at Ultima Underworld where you have uh, different items with different durability and um, you know it gives you a reason to to switch your sword more often because that sword that's on the ground there that's only slightly damaged and yours is already pretty damaged so if if the items in the world are properly distributed if they are properly balanced i think that item durability can add something of um something of a survival uh, mechanic or a survival aspect to to a game, an interesting survival aspect to a game. Um, what's not interesting is having your items break all the time and having them uh, repaired all the time and uh, not being able to, or not being able to repair them at all. That's also another one. Uh, so, I would, if if I went into, um, into the topic of item durability, into implementing item durability in Monomyth, which I'm still on the fence about, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, I would definitely try to, to push it more into the direction of Ultima Underworld and less into the direction of uh, something you see in. A lot of MMORPGs where it's basically just a time sink, uh, and and not really a fun mechanic. I'd say I'd say a uh, bigger culprit of item durability in that in that time sink form is um, survival games. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know. I I just used the word, and I <laughs> I actually I actually thought exactly about uh, about. Uh, survival games, but that's actually not how I mean that. <laughs> how I mean uh, survival, a uh, survival aspect. I think um, more of a, a resource management aspect here. Yeah. Um, and not this, 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 this endless slog of uh, I have to get more, 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 more iron ore to make some new sword or repair my sword. Or, oh my god, As that's 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 something I think is boring. So you won't see any of that 
uh, if there's any dur item durability in Monomyth in the end, it will be very close to what you saw in Ultima Underworld, where I th I actually think it adds to the gameplay uh, an interesting in an interesting way. Now, when the kick when when the Kickstarter had gone had gone live for Monomyth, you had put mm -hmm. up a you had put up a de you had put up a bit of a demo for the thing. Which, um, um, when I was doing my research, I found that some people had speed ran the demo and got and got through the whole yeah. thing in seven minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but what? But um, what were what would you? But obvious, obviously, the demo, some a demo like that is a good vertical slice to get feedback on. But what would you say were some of the learning experiences you took from it that you plan on implementing into um, Monomyth? Well, actually, um, the feedback I, I got a lot of feedback on on the Kickstarter demo, and some feedback overlapped with uh, stuff that I already had I wouldn't say feared but sorry um, sorry I had something here uh, uh, some 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 feedback overlapped uh, not with something that I maybe feared but something that I expected people would say and as a result uh, I, I reconsidered a couple of couple of things and one of those things is the uh, the safe system actually um, as I've mentioned before uh, the original safe system was more or less a checkpoint system as it uh, was uh, present in Kingsfield and in and in Dark Souls, right? Uh, but here's the thing. When a game shifts more and more into the direction of Arx Fatalis and Ultima Underworld, you have this exploration aspect to the game. And you want to try things out. And, uh, for example, attack an NPC. Uh, you want to bribe an NPC, or you want to try a certain item, etc., etc. Uh, and that does not, from a design perspective, that does not go well with um, with a safe system where everything is uh, set in stone. Basically, you the the consequences they are permanent. Right, you can't reload really. I mean. Maybe you could if you you know uh, alt F four out of the <laughs> out of the game, but um, it does not go well with, with uh, this this exploration aspect does not go well with um, a safe system where there is permanent consequences. And uh, I thought of that before I released the demo. And then. Uh, I got feedback and they were like, yeah, it's uh, nice and this is maybe something you can change and this and this is maybe something you can change. And the safe system. <laughs> and the safe system would be better in a different way. And um, I also mentioned before I, I replayed uh, System Shock where I actually experienced myself this... Um, this dilemma where I just wanted to try something out and so I needed to reload and then I thought well but you can't do that in Monomyth and people also noticed the same <laughs> people actually mentioned it in the feedback so I said yeah okay uh, it is the correct design decision for where the game stands at the moment it is the correct design decision mm -hmm. to actually uh, implement uh, a different um, safe system. Uh, so I did that. I implemented a free safe system. Um, a consequence from that will probably be that the shrines will be much rarer. So you won't find as many shrines in the world as um, as is the, the case in the demo. So only 
like one maybe two shrines per per um zone uh, at the moment there's i believe four in the demo so it will be definitely uh fewer in the uh full game so that is that is um one thing the feedback from the kickstarter more or less confirmed for me it basically confirmed uh what i already were doubting or doubtful about mm -hmm. so yeah now with that with that in mind uh what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a release window on either the, either the next update or the next um or the next version mm -hmm. um well for anyone that um that pledged on a certain on a certain kickstarter level uh, there will be a closed beta mm -hmm. and that closed beta will be released hopefully uh, at the beginning of the second quarter of next year uh, the game's release is planned for june uh, June 2022 and the um, the closed beta is planned three months before that so uh, March essentially I guess I suppose end of March probably around that time so that is um, that is the next playable version of uh, Monomyth that will be given to 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 players uh in this case kickstarter backers um at the moment i'm creating content so i'm just doing level design you know and um, distributing items and distributing enemies and polishing enemy design and uh doing some animations maybe uh for you know attacks and different stuff uh so i'm, I'm implementing content and i'm doing that till the end of the year that is now the big content creation phase now till the end of the year and after that i will start polishing what i've created in the last three to four months um, for the closed beta and in the closed beta i'm then again looking for the feedback of um, players and then uh, i will implement that and hopefully hopefully it will be ready in uh, June, end of end of June, probably. So or around around that time, roughly. That is that is that is the plan. So, yeah. <laughs> but let's see, <laughs> let's see about it. Well, but yeah, yeah. In lieu in lieu of in lieu of that, and to make sure that I don't jinx you. You know, I've learned I learned a long time ago never tempt the gods of irony. <laughs> But with but with all of that with all of that said, um, I want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my, to come onto my temple and enjoy the no problem. Um, particular brand of insanity that come that goes down around here. <laughs> thank you. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often okay, say around thanks. here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.